The American Revolutionary War stands as one of the most pivotal moments in history, forever altering the course of nations and reshaping the destiny of a fledgling nation, the United States of America. In this brief exploration, we will journey through the crucible of the revolution, unraveling its causes, key figures, and events, all of which converge to birth a new nation and redefine the very essence of liberty. At the heart of this epic struggle lay profound tensions between the American colonies and the British crown. The colonists, thriving in a land brimming with promise, found themselves shackled by the heavy hand of British rule. These tensions, ignited by a series of oppressive policies and forged in the crucible of resistance, ultimately led to a war that would decide the fate of a burgeoning nation. The American Revolution did not erupt overnight. It smoldered beneath the surface for years. To understand its genesis, we must delve into the causes that fanned the flames of rebellion. The oppressive British taxation policies, exemplified by the infamous Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts, serve as critical kindling. These policies burdened the colonists with exorbitant taxes and ignited a fervor for resistance. As we explore further, we shall witness how colonial defiance burgeoned in response to these fiscal injustices. One of the most iconic symbols of colonial protest is the Boston Tea Party, an act of rebellion, a declaration of dissent. We will immerse ourselves in the vivid imagery of that December night in 1773 when enraged colonists, disguised as Mohawk Indians, stormed British ships and hurled chests of tea into Boston Harbor. This audacious act shall stand as a testament to the unyielding spirit of the American people. But as the tea leaves drifted on the water surface, ripples of consequences spread far and wide. The British crown retaliated with punitive measures, known as the Coercive Acts, further fanning the flames of rebellion and tightening the grip of colonial discontent. The path to independence was strewn with obstacles, yet it was paved with determination and unwavering resolve. We will journey alongside the colonists as they convened the First Continental Congress, an assembly of colonial leaders united in their pursuit of liberty. Their resolutions, a clarion call for justice, would set the stage for the trials to come. Our voyage shall also take us to the sleepy towns of Lexington and Concord, where the first shots of the American Revolution rang out. These battles, ignited by the British quest to seize colonial weapons, marked the outbreak of hostilities that would engulf the land. In the midst of this turmoil, a towering figure emerged, George Washington. We will witness his appointment as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, a momentous event that would come to define the struggle for independence. As the leader of a ragtag army, Washington's character and leadership would be tested in the crucible of war. In this exploration of the American Revolutionary War, we will not merely recount history. We will endeavor to feel the pulsating heartbeat of a nation's birth, the fervor of resistance, and the inexorable march toward freedom. Central to the story of the American Revolutionary War is the visionary role of Thomas Jefferson in drafting the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson, a brilliant and eloquent statesman, crafted the document that would become the ideological cornerstone of the nation's quest for freedom. His words, etched into history, proclaimed that all men are created equal and endowed with unalienable rights. The Declaration was not just a proclamation of independence but an articulation of the principles that would define a new nation. On a fateful day in Philadelphia, the Continental Congress came together to adopt the Declaration of Independence. July 4, 1776, is a date forever etched in the annals of American history. The delegates, representing the thirteen colonies, affixed their signatures to the document that severed their ties with British rule. This act of bold defiance marked the birth of a new nation, one that would be governed by the consent of the governed, a revolutionary concept in its time. The Declaration of Independence was not merely a declaration of separation. It was a statement of American principles and grievances. It proclaimed that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, and when a government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. It catalogued the long train of abuses and usurpations inflicted upon the colonies by King George III, justifying their decision to declare independence. As the Revolutionary War raged on, pivotal battles unfolded that would shape the outcome of the conflict. Saratoga, 
a turning point in the war saw American forces triumph over the British, securing vital French support that proved instrumental. The daring crossing of the Delaware River at Trenton bolstered American morale, while the decisive siege at Yorktown sealed the fate of the British. Foreign support, particularly France's aid, played a crucial role in providing troops, supplies, and naval assistance to the American cause, turning the tide of war in their favor. With the war finally concluding, the Treaty of Paris in 1783 brought the struggle for independence to an official close. This treaty, negotiated by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay, marked the diplomatic recognition of American independence by Great Britain. It established the territorial boundaries of the newly formed United States, extending from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. The treaty's signing signaled the end of a long and arduous journey and the dawn of a new nation, free from the shackles of colonial rule. In these critical moments, from the drafting of the Declaration of Independence to the battles that shaped the outcome of the war, and finally, the Treaty of Paris, the United States emerged as a beacon of liberty and self-determination. The sacrifices of those who fought for independence and the visionary leadership of individuals like Thomas Jefferson laid the foundation for a nation founded on principles of freedom, equality, and self-governance. The Revolutionary War was a crucible in which the American identity was forged. It was a struggle not only for independence but for the very principles upon which the nation would be built. The experience of resisting British oppression and fighting for self-determination left an indelible mark on the American psyche. The colonists evolved into a people with a shared sense of purpose and a deep commitment to the ideals of liberty, equality, and representative government. One of the most enduring legacies of the Revolutionary War is the creation of the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The Founding Fathers, drawing on the lessons of the conflict and the intellectual currents of the Enlightenment, crafted a framework for government that balanced power and protected individual rights. The Constitution established a federal system with checks and balances, while the Bill of Rights enshrined fundamental freedoms, including freedom of speech, religion, and the right to a fair trial. These documents remain the bedrock of American democracy, guiding the nation for over two centuries. The impact of the Revolutionary War extended far beyond America's borders. It served as an inspiration for oppressed peoples around the world who aspired to throw off the yoke of tyranny. The successful American Revolution kindled the flames of liberty and democracy in other parts of the globe, including the French Revolution. The ideals of self-determination and popular sovereignty that America championed became guiding principles for those seeking to establish governments based on the consent of the governed. The Revolutionary War was a defining moment in American history. It marked the birth of a nation founded on the revolutionary principles of liberty, equality, and self-governance. The sacrifices of the patriots who fought for independence— and the vision of the Founding Fathers gave rise to a republic that would become a beacon of hope and freedom to the world. The legacy of the Revolutionary War endures in the hearts and minds of Americans. It serves as a reminder of the price paid for freedom and the principles upon which the nation was built. The courage, resilience, and determination of the patriots who stood against tyranny continue to inspire and remind us of the enduring values that define the United States. The Revolutionary War, in all its complexity and significance, remains an integral part of America's collective memory and identity. In the aftermath of the Great War, there was a grand gathering of world leaders in the Palace of Versailles, just outside Paris. The year was 1919, and the world had just witnessed the end of World War I, a conflict that had devastated nations and claimed millions of lives. The purpose of this gathering was to negotiate, and sign a peace treaty that would bring an end to the hostilities. Little did they know that the Treaty of Versailles would plant the seeds of discord that would later grow into the devastating World War II. The stage was set, and the leaders of the victorious Allied powers, including President Woodrow Wilson of the United States, Prime Minister David Lloyd George of the United Kingdom, and Premier Georges Clemenceau of France, convened to discuss the terms of peace. However, the atmosphere in the room was far from harmonious. The treaty negotiations were fraught with tension from the very beginning. Germany, which had borne the brunt of the blame for the war in the eyes of the Allies, was not invited to participate in the talks initially. 
Instead, the terms of the treaty were dictated to the German delegation when they arrived later. This act of exclusion and humiliation left a deep scar on the German national psyche, setting the stage for future grievances. The Treaty of Versailles imposed severe penalties on Germany. The nation was forced to accept full responsibility for the war, resulting in enormous reparations payments and the loss of territory. The treaty also limited the size of the German military and placed restrictions on their ability to rebuild their armed forces. To add insult to injury, Germany was not allowed to join the newly formed League of Nations, an international organization aimed at promoting peace and cooperation. As Germany struggled to meet the stringent demands of the Treaty of Versailles, the economic situation within the country deteriorated rapidly. The reparations payments, combined with the loss of industrial territory, crippled the German economy. Hyperinflation ran rampant, making the German mark virtually worthless. People struggled to buy even basic necessities. In the midst of this economic turmoil, a charismatic and fervent politician named Adolf Hitler began to gain prominence. Hitler, who had served as a soldier in World War I, used the widespread anger and resentment in Germany to his advantage. He blamed the Treaty of Versailles for the nation's suffering and promised to restore Germany to its former glory. As Hitler rose to power, he dismantled the restrictions placed on the German military and embarked on a campaign of territorial expansion. His aggressive actions, such as the annexation of Austria and the occupation of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, were met with appeasement by the Western powers, who hoped to avoid another war at all costs. The memory of the Great War was still fresh in their minds, and they were desperate to prevent a new conflict. However, Hitler's ambitions knew no bounds. In 1939, he shocked the world by invading Poland, an act that directly violated the Treaty of Versailles and triggered the start of World War II. The treaty that was meant to secure peace had, in fact, sowed the seeds of a new and even more destructive conflict. The Treaty of Versailles with its punitive measures and exclusionary approach, played a pivotal role in setting the stage for World War II. It left Germany in a state of economic and political turmoil, creating the conditions for the rise of Adolf Hitler and his aggressive expansionist agenda. The failure of the treaty to achieve lasting peace highlights the importance of diplomacy, compromise, and a deeper understanding of the complex dynamics that can lead to conflict on a global scale. As the world would soon learn, the Treaty of Versailles was not the end of the story but rather the beginning of a new and even darker chapter in history. The 1920s, often referred to as the Roaring Twenties, were a time of exuberance and economic growth in the United States and other parts of the world. Technological advancements, such as the mass production of automobiles, fueled the consumer revolution. Jazz music played through the streets, and the stock market seemed to soar endlessly. The end of World War I had brought optimism, but it had also left scars. Europe was in ruins, and the war had caused immense debt for many nations. However, the United States appeared to be an exception. It emerged from the war as an economic powerhouse, its industrial might untouched by the conflict. The optimism of the 1920s, however, was built on a fragile foundation. In October 1929, the stock market in the United States, which had been riding a wave of speculation, crashed dramatically. The Wall Street crash of 1929 sent shockwaves through the global economy. As stock prices plummeted, panic set in, and investors rushed to sell their holdings. The crash wiped out fortunes, leading to a cascade of business failures and a sharp rise in unemployment. People who had once enjoyed the luxuries of the Roaring Twenties found themselves standing in breadlines. The economic collapse in the United States had a domino effect that rippled across the world. International trade dried up as countries implemented protectionist policies, imposing tariffs and quotas to shield their industries from foreign competition. This isolationism only exacerbated the economic woes. In Germany, the effects of the Great Depression were particularly severe. The country was already reeling from the economic burden imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, and the sudden economic downturn pushed millions of Germans into unemployment and poverty. It was in this environment that extremist political groups, including the Nazi Party, gained support. Throughout the 1930s, 
governments tried various measures to combat the economic crisis. In the United States, President Franklin D. Roosevelt introduced the New Deal, a series of programs aimed at providing relief, recovery, and reform. These included public works projects, social welfare programs, and banking reforms. However, recovery was slow and uneven. It wasn't until the outbreak of World War II in 1939 that the global economy finally began to rebound. The war effort created jobs and stimulated industrial production, effectively pulling nations out of the economic doldrums. The Great Depression left an indelible mark on the world. It exposed the vulnerabilities of the global economy and the interconnectedness of nations. It also demonstrated the need for effective government intervention in times of crisis. Moreover, the economic turmoil of the 1930s had a direct link to the outbreak of World War II. The rise of extremist ideologies and the desperation of people affected by the Depression contributed to the political climate that allowed Adolf Hitler to come to power in Germany and pursue aggressive expansionist policies. In the early 20th century, Italy found itself at a crossroads. The aftermath of World War I had left the nation disillusioned and economically strained. It was in this turbulent environment that a charismatic leader named Benito Mussolini rose to power, paving the way for the establishment of the fascist regime in Italy. This story explores the rise of fascism in Italy and its impact on the nation. Italy, like many other European nations, had borne the heavy burden of World War I. The conflict had drained its resources, left its economy in shambles, and resulted in the loss of countless lives. The Italian people were left with a sense of disillusionment and frustration, feeling that their sacrifices had not been adequately rewarded. Amid this atmosphere of unrest, Benito Mussolini, a former socialist and journalist, emerged as a charismatic and forceful leader. Mussolini founded the National Fascist Party in 1921, a political movement that promised to restore Italy to its former glory. He rallied his followers with fiery speeches and a vision of a powerful, and unified Italy. Mussolini's moment of reckoning came in October 1922 when he and his black shirt paramilitary units marched on Rome. The aim was to pressure the Italian king, Victor Emmanuel III, to appoint Mussolini as the prime minister. Fearing a potential civil war, the king acquiesced, and Mussolini assumed the position of prime minister on October 29, 1922. Mussolini's rise to power marked the beginning of a new era in Italian politics. He quickly consolidated his authority, dissolved opposition parties, and suppressed dissent through censorship and intimidation. Mussolini's regime was characterized by authoritarianism, nationalism, and the suppression of individual freedoms. Under Mussolini's leadership, Italy underwent a radical transformation. Mussolini aimed to create a totalitarian state where the interests of the individual were subjugated to the needs of the nation. He centralized power, promoted a cult of personality, and sought to control every aspect of Italian life. The fascist regime implemented policies that emphasized strict control over the media, education, and the economy. Dissent was not tolerated, and those who opposed the regime faced persecution. Mussolini's vision of a revitalized Italy was pursued at the expense of personal freedoms and civil liberties. Mussolini's ambitions extended beyond Italy's borders. He sought to expand Italy's territory and influence in the Mediterranean and beyond. In 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia, a move that drew international condemnation. This act of aggression would later lead Italy to align itself with Nazi Germany in the lead-up to World War II. The fascist regime faced growing challenges as the 1930s progressed. Economic problems persisted, and Italy's aggressive foreign policies drew it into conflicts that strained its resources. In 1943, as Allied forces advanced through Italy, Mussolini was arrested, and the fascist regime began to crumble. The fascist regime in Italy, under the leadership of Benito Mussolini, was was marked by authoritarianism, the suppression of dissent and a cult of personality. Mussolini's ambitions led Italy down a path of aggression and ultimately into World War II. In the turbulent years following World War I, Germany was grappling with economic devastation, political turmoil, and a sense of national humiliation brought about by the Treaty of Versailles. 
In this challenging environment, a dark force began to rise, the Nazi party. Led by Adolf Hitler, the Nazis would go on to shape the course of history in the most sinister of ways. This story unfolds the ascent of the Nazi party in Germany. As the 1920s dawned, Germany was a nation in crisis. The Treaty of Versailles imposed harsh penalties on the country, including massive reparations, territorial losses, and strict limitations on its military. Hyperinflation had rendered the German mark nearly worthless, and unemployment soared. It was in this atmosphere of anger, resentment, and economic despair that the seeds of extremism took root. Various political factions, including the Communist Party and the National Socialist German Workers' Party, commonly known as the Nazi Party, vied for the allegiance of a disillusioned population. The Nazi Party emerged from the shadows in the early 1920s. Founded in Munich in 1920 by Adolf Hitler, the party's early years were marked by obscurity and limited influence. Hitler, a charismatic and persuasive speaker, attracted a small but devoted following. The Nazis espoused the nationalist and anti-Semitic ideology. They blamed the Jews, along with other perceived enemies, for Germany's woes and advocated for the creation of a racially pure German state. The party's emblem, the swastika, became a symbol of hatred and oppression. In 1923, the Nazis attempted to seize power in what became known as the Beer Hall Putsch. Hitler and his followers, armed with rifles, marched on a beer hall in Munich where government officials were meeting. The coup failed, and Hitler was arrested and sentenced to prison. While in prison, Hitler wrote, Mein Kampf, an autobiographical manifesto in which he outlined his vision for Germany and his hatred for Jews. It would become a foundational text for Nazi ideology. Upon his release from prison, Hitler realized that a violent coup would not bring him to power. Instead, he adopted a strategy of using the democratic system to gain influence. The Nazis began participating in elections and slowly but steadily garnered support. The worldwide economic depression of the 1930s created fertile ground for extremist parties like the Nazis. As the existing political order faltered, many Germans turned to radical solutions. In the July 1932 elections, the Nazi party became the largest party in the Reichstag, Germany's parliament. With their newfound electoral strength, the Nazis pressured President Paul von Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as Chancellor of Germany in January 1933. Hitler's appointment marked the beginning of a dark chapter in German history. Once in power, the Nazis wasted no time in consolidating their control. They swiftly passed the Reichstag Fire Decree, which suspended civil liberties and allowed for the arrest of political opponents. The Enabling Act, passed in March 1933, effectively granted Hitler dictatorial powers. Over the next few years, the Nazis solidified their grip on Germany. They implemented a totalitarian regime characterized by censorship, propaganda, and the suppression of dissent. They initiated a campaign of persecution against Jews and other minority groups, culminating in the horrors of the Holocaust. The ascent of the Nazi party in Germany and its subsequent actions would lead to the darkest chapter in human history, World War II and the Holocaust. Millions of lives would be lost, and the world would be forever changed. Amid the global turmoil of the early 20th century, another dark chapter in history was unfolding in the Far East, Imperial Japan's relentless expansionism. This story sheds light on Japan's quest for territorial dominance, militarization, and its role in setting the stage for World War II in the Pacific. At the turn of the 20th century, Japan had undergone a remarkable transformation. Emerging from centuries of isolation, it embraced modernization and industrialization with zeal. The Meiji Restoration in the late 19th century ushered in a new era, where Japan rapidly modernized its economy and military. Japan's newfound strength allowed it to assert itself on the world stage. In 1905, it shocked the world by defeating Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, becoming the first Asian power to defeat a European nation in a modern conflict. Japan's appetite for expansion began to manifest itself in Asia. In 1910, it formally annexed Korea, a move that marked the beginning of its imperial ambitions in the region. The Japanese government implemented a policy of assimilation, 
seeking to erase Korean culture and language. As Japan expanded its influence, it took control of Chinese territories during the First Sino-Japanese War and later occupied Manchuria in 1931. These aggressive actions were met with international condemnation, but Japan pressed on with its expansionist agenda. Japan's militarization went hand-in-hand -hand with its expansionist policies. The military, known as the Imperial Japanese Army, gained significant power and influence in Japanese politics. It pursued an aggressive agenda and viewed conquest as a means of securing resources and prestige. The military also became increasingly intertwined with Japan's government and industry. This fusion of interests led to a state-controlled economy geared towards war production, further driving Japan's militaristic in 1937. Japan's invasion of China marked the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. The conflict raged on for years, resulting in widespread devastation and loss of life. The international community, including the United States, imposed economic sanctions on Japan in response to its aggression. The events in Asia, particularly Japan's expansionism and its invasion of China, were a prelude to a larger conflict. In 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, bringing the United States into World War II. This marked the beginning of the Pacific Theater, a brutal and far-reaching conflict that would shape the course of the war. Japan's expansionist agenda had now brought it into direct conflict with the world's major powers. The battles that followed in the Pacific and Southeast Asia were characterized by fierce fighting, island-hopping campaigns, and the use of new and devastating weapons. The legacy of Imperial Japan's expansionism is one of pain and suffering. Millions of lives were lost in the wake of its aggression, and entire nations were left scarred by its actions. The conflict in the Pacific theater witnessed some of the most ferocious battles in history, including the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan's expansionist ambitions led to its defeat and occupation by Allied forces. The post-war era saw Japan undergo significant political and social reforms renouncing its militarism and embracing a path of peaceful coexistence. As the summer of 1939 drew to a close, Europe stood on the precipice of a cataclysmic event that would plunge the world into another devastating conflict, World War II. On September 1, 1939, the peace in Europe was shattered when Nazi Germany, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, launched a full-scale invasion of Poland. This act of aggression would trigger a chain reaction, leading to the outbreak of the most destructive war in human history. In the years leading up to 1939, tensions had been steadily rising in Europe. Adolf Hitler, the Chancellor of Germany, had been aggressively pursuing a policy of territorial expansion. His ambitions extended far beyond Germany's borders, and he aimed to create a greater German empire that encompassed much of Eastern Europe. One of Hitler's key objectives was the acquisition of Danzig and the Polish Corridor a strip of land that separated East Prussia from the rest of Germany. The Polish Corridor had been awarded to Poland following World War I, and its loss was a source of great resentment for Germany. On August 23, 1939, just days before the invasion, Germany and the Soviet Union, led by Joseph Stalin, signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a non-aggression treaty. This pact contained a secret protocol that divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influence effectively granting the Soviets a free hand in the Baltic states and eastern Poland. The pact served as a green light for Hitler to proceed with his plans to invade Poland. He was now confident that the Soviet Union would not intervene. On the morning of September 1, 1939, the world watched in shock as German forces stormed across the Polish border. The invasion was characterized by a swift and brutal blitzkrieg, or lightning war, strategy. German tanks, infantry, and air support overwhelmed the Polish defenses. The Polish military, though valiant and determined, was ill-equipped to deal with the onslaught of the highly mechanized and well-organized German forces. Within weeks, Poland was encircled and besieged. The invasion of Poland sent shockwaves across Europe and the world. The international community reacted with condemnation and both France and the United Kingdom declared war on Germany on September 3, 1939, honoring their commitments to Poland. However, the response from Western allies was limited. 
The war in Poland largely remained a one-sided affair, as the Soviet Union launched its invasion of eastern Poland on September 17, 1939. The Poles found themselves caught between two powerful aggressors. The invasion of Poland marked the official beginning of World War II. For the Polish people, it meant years of occupation, oppression, and suffering under both Nazi and Soviet rule. The world watched as the principles of sovereignty and self-determination were trampled upon. The events in Poland set in motion a chain of events that would lead to a global conflict of unprecedented scale. The war would rage on for six years, cost tens of millions of lives, and reshape the world in ways that are still felt today. In the wake of the swift and brutal invasion of Poland in September 1939, Europe was gripped by a tense calm, a period that would come to be known as the Phony War. This story delves into the strange and uncertain interlude between the outbreak of World War II and the full-scale onslaught of conflict. Following the invasion of Poland, the world had expected an immediate and decisive response from the Western Allies, particularly France and the United Kingdom who had declared war on Nazi Germany in defense of Poland. However, what followed was a strange and perplexing period of inaction. This curious lull in the fighting, which lasted from September 1939 to April 1940, would later be referred to as the Phony War or the Sitzkrieg, because of the apparent lack of major military operations on the Western Front. Several factors contributed to the cautious approach taken by the Western Allies during this period. One of the key reasons was the legacy of World War I, which had left a deep scar on the collective memory. The horrors of trench warfare and the staggering loss of life were vivid in the minds of political leaders and the public alike. As a result, there was a strong desire to avoid a repeat of such a protracted and devastating conflict. The Western Allies hoped that diplomatic negotiations might bring a swift end to the hostilities, and they were hesitant to rush into battle without a clear strategy. France, in particular, relied heavily on the Maginot Line, a series of heavily fortified defenses along its border with Germany. The French believed that these fortifications would provide ample protection, rendering a German invasion nearly impossible. This belief in the impregnability of the Maginot Line contributed to a false sense of security. During the Phony War, there were some limited engagements and skirmishes along the Franco-German border, but these did not escalate into full-scale offensives. The British Expeditionary Force was deployed to France, but its role was primarily defensive. In the air, both the Royal Air Force and the German Luftwaffe engaged in sporadic battles, but these did not lead to any decisive outcomes. The naval war, however, was more active, with both sides conducting naval blockades and escort missions. The phony war came to an abrupt end in April 1940 when Germany launched a massive offensive against France and the Low Countries. The blitzkrieg tactics that had proven so effective in Poland were now unleashed on a grander scale. The world watched in shock as German forces swiftly overran France and approached the English Channel. The complacency and hesitancy of the Western Allies during the phony war had allowed Germany to regroup and plan a more significant offensive. The result was the fall of France and the beginning of a new phase in the war. The phony war, though marked by inaction and a false sense of security, was a crucial phase in the early stages of World War II. It revealed the difficulties of transitioning from a state of peace to full-scale war and the challenges of adapting to a rapidly changing battlefield. This period of calm, deceptive as it may have been, serves as a reminder that amid great historical events, there are moments of uncertainty and hesitation. As the world held its collective breath during the phony war, a storm was brewing within Nazi Germany. The calm of the preceding months was shattered in April 1940 when the German war machine unleashed a devastating new form of warfare, Blitzkrieg. This story explores the ruthless efficiency and lightning speed with which Germany conquered Western Europe. The term, Blitzkrieg, translates to, lightning war, in English, and it perfectly encapsulates the essence of this new military doctrine. Blitzkrieg was not a single tactic but a coordinated strategy that relied on surprise, speed, and overwhelming force to achieve rapid victories. The Germans had been refining this doctrine for years, and it was about to be put to the test. On May 10, 1940, 
German forces launched a massive invasion of France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. The world watched in shock as the German army, equipped with tanks, artillery, and highly mobile infantry, swiftly advanced through the Ardennes forest, a region that had been considered impassable by the French. The Germans employed a combination of tactics that defined Blitzkrieg. Fast-moving panzer divisions led the way, followed closely by infantry and air support. Encirclement and cut-off tactics were used to isolate and overwhelm enemy forces, preventing them from regrouping or receiving reinforcements. The speed of the German advance was staggering. In just six weeks, German forces had penetrated deep into France, encircling the French and British expeditionary forces at Dunkirk. The evacuation of Dunkirk, known as the Miracle of Dunkirk, saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers but left the French military reeling. The German army continued its relentless advance, capturing Paris on June 14, 1940. The French government, facing imminent defeat, surrendered to Germany on June 22, 1940, signing an armistice that effectively divided France into an occupied zone in the north and an unoccupied zone in the south. The success of Blitzkrieg in Western Europe sent shockwaves through military establishments around the world. The traditional tactics of trench warfare and static defenses had been rendered obsolete. The lessons learned from the rapid German victories would shape the strategies of the Allies in the years to come. Blitzkrieg was not only a military strategy but also a psychological weapon. The lightning speed of the German advance sowed panic and confusion among the defenders. The world had witnessed the devastating effectiveness of modern warfare, and the balance of power had shifted dramatically. The fall of France and the success of Blitzkrieg set the stage for further German expansion in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. It also made clear that the war was no longer confined to one region but had become a truly global conflict. Blitzkrieg, with its breathtaking speed and overwhelming force, was a game-changer in the early years of World War II. It redefined the art of warfare and left a lasting impact on military doctrine. In the spring of 1940, the world watched in disbelief as Nazi Germany's Blitzkrieg tactics tore through Western Europe with lightning speed. France, once considered a military powerhouse, fell to the relentless German advance in a matter of weeks. This story delves into the events that led to the fall of France in 1940. The stage was set for the fall of France when German forces launched a massive invasion of Western Europe on May 10, 1940. The German blitzkrieg tactics, characterized by rapid and coordinated movements of tanks, infantry, and air support, took the French and their allies by surprise. The Germans, under the command of generals such as Heinz Guderian and Erwin Rommel, advanced with astonishing speed and agility. They bypassed heavily fortified positions along the Maginot Line, an extensive system of fortifications along the French-German border, and penetrated deep into France through the Ardennes Forest, a region previously thought impassable for armored units. As the German army closed in on British and French forces, a desperate evacuation was launched at the port of Dunkirk. Operation Dynamo, as it was called, involved the rescue of over 330,000 Allied troops from the beaches of Dunkirk between May 26 and June 4, 1940. It was a miraculous operation that saved a significant portion of the British Expeditionary Force. The fall of France seemed inevitable as German forces continued their advance. On June 14, 1940, German troops entered Paris marking a moment of profound humiliation for France. The French government, recognizing the dire situation, requested an armistice. On June 22, 1940, an armistice was signed between France and Nazi Germany. It divided France into two zones, an occupied zone in the north and a nominally independent, unoccupied Vichy government in the south. The city of Vichy became the symbolic center of the collaborationist government led by Marshal Philippe Pétain. The fall of France was a shocking and sobering moment for the Allies. It shattered the illusion of French invincibility and raised questions about the effectiveness of their military strategies and leadership. The swift and decisive success of Blitzkrieg's tactics had exposed vulnerabilities in traditional defensive tactics. With the fall of France, Germany gained control of a significant portion of Western Europe. 
It marked a turning point in World War II, as the Allies faced the daunting challenge of regrouping and planning their next moves. While France was occupied by German forces, a resistance movement began to take shape. Underground networks and partisan groups would play a vital role in the eventual liberation of France. The fall of France in 1940 was a pivotal moment in World War II. It demonstrated the power and effectiveness of blitzkrieg tactics and forced the Allies to reevaluate their strategies. France, once a symbol of European military might, had fallen, but the spirit of resistance lived on, and the struggle to liberate the country would become a defining chapter in the history of France and the Second World War. On the quiet Sunday morning of December 7, 1941, the world was jolted awake by a devastating surprise, an attack on the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This story recounts the events of that fateful day, forever etched in history as the catalyst for the United States' entry into World War II. The attack on Pearl Harbor began at 7.55 a.m. when a wave of Japanese fighter planes and bombers descended upon the U.S. naval base. The assault was sudden, ferocious, and meticulously planned. Within minutes, battleships, cruisers, and aircraft were engulfed in flames and smoke. The attack was a master stroke of military precision and coordination. The Japanese aircraft targeted the heart of the Pacific Fleet, including the battleships moored along. Battleship Row. The USS Arizona, in particular, suffered a catastrophic explosion that sent it to the harbor's bottom, taking with it over 1,000 American lives. The attack on Pearl Harbor inflicted severe damage on the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Eight American battleships were either sunk or heavily damaged, along with numerous other vessels. Over 180 aircraft were destroyed, and more than 2,400 Americans lost their lives with another 1,200 injured. The attack also plunged the United States into a state of shock and anger. President Franklin D. Roosevelt famously described December 7, 1941, as a date which will live in infamy. The following day, the United States declared war on Japan, officially entering World War II. The attack on Pearl Harbor was part of Japan's larger strategy to establish dominance in the Pacific. Japan sought to secure valuable resources and establish a sphere of influence in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. In the months following Pearl Harbor, Japan rapidly expanded its territorial holdings, capturing an array of islands and territories across the Pacific, including Guam, Wake Island, the Philippines, and parts of New Guinea. In response to Japan's territorial advances, the United States devised a strategic counteroffensive in the Pacific known as the Island Hopping Campaign This strategy, under the command of General Douglas MacArthur and Admiral Chester Nimitz, aimed to bypass heavily fortified Japanese-held islands and instead target those that were strategically valuable for airfields and naval bases. The Island Hopping Campaign was characterized by amphibious assaults on key islands, such as Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Saipan, and Iwo Jima. These operations were fiercely contested, with brutal battles fought in dense jungles and on heavily fortified beaches. The island hopping campaign was a grueling and hard-fought series of battles, but it gradually turned the tide of the Pacific War in favor of the Allies. The capture of these strategic islands allowed the United States to establish bases from which they could launch air raids and naval operations deep into Japanese-held territory. The Battle of Midway in June 1942 where the U.S. Navy decisively defeated the Japanese fleet, was a turning point in the Pacific War. It halted Japanese expansion and marked the beginning of a slow, methodical advance by the Allies towards Japan. The attack on Pearl Harbor was a pivotal moment in World War II, propelling the United States into the conflict and igniting a fierce determination to avenge the loss and secure victory. The subsequent island-hopping campaign demonstrated the resilience and strategic acumen of the U.S. military, ultimately leading to the rollback of Japanese territorial gains and the eventual end of the war in the Pacific. It was a testament to the resolve of nations and the enduring human spirit in the face of adversity. On June 22, 1941, the world witnessed one of the most significant turning points of World War II as Nazi Germany launched Operation Barbarossa the invasion of the Soviet Union. 
This story delves into the motivations behind Hitler's audacious move and the brutal consequences that followed. Adolf Hitler's ambitions were not limited to the conquest of Western Europe. He harbored a deep-seated desire to expand German influence to the East, specifically into the vast territories of the Soviet Union. Hitler believed in the concept of Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people and he saw the fertile lands of the East as the answer to Germany's economic problems. Operation Barbarossa involved the largest invasion force in history at that time, with around 3 million German troops and thousands of tanks and aircraft. The initial stages of the invasion were marked by swift advances as German forces overwhelmed Soviet defenses. Key cities and regions, including Kiev and Smolensk, fell to the Germans. The brutality of the Eastern Front was stark. German Einsatzgruppen followed the army, carrying out mass shootings of Jews, communists, and perceived enemies. The invasion unleashed a campaign of terror and devastation that would continue for years. One of the most infamous episodes of Barbarossa was the Siege of Leningrad. The city endured a horrific 872-day blockade, during which residents faced starvation, disease, and relentless shelling. It is estimated that over a million civilians perished during the siege. As German forces advanced deeper into the Soviet Union, they set their sights on Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad, which raged from August 23, 1942, to February 2, 1943, would become one of the deadliest battles in history and a pivotal turning point in World War II. The battle for Stalingrad was marked by intense urban combat, with brutal house-to-house -house fighting. The city's name was symbolic for both sides, and neither was willing to yield. The Soviets, under the command of General Georgi Zhukov, launched a counteroffensive that encircled the German 6th Army inside the city. In early 1943, the situation for the German 6th Army became increasingly dire. Surrounded and cut off from supplies, the German soldiers faced starvation and exhaustion. On February 2, 1943, General Friedrich Paulus, the commander of the 6th Army, surrendered. It was a humiliating defeat for Nazi Germany and a turning point in the Eastern Front. The Battle of Stalingrad marked the beginning of a long and painful Soviet advance westward, leading to the eventual capture of Berlin in 1945. It also signaled the end of Germany's offensive capabilities on the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front of World War II was a theater of unimaginable suffering and sacrifice with millions of soldiers and civilians losing their lives. Barbarossa, while initially successful for Germany, ultimately proved to be a catastrophic miscalculation, as it drew the Soviet Union into the Allied camp and set the stage for the eventual defeat of Nazi Germany. Going back a little bit, the Battle of Stalingrad, a harrowing and protracted conflict, stands as a symbol of resilience and determination in the face of unimaginable adversity. This story recounts the pivotal events of the battle and its significance as a turning point in World War II. Stalingrad, a major industrial city on the banks of the Volga River, held immense strategic importance. It was a critical transportation hub, and control of the city would open the way to the Caucasus oil fields, a vital resource for the German war effort. The Battle of Stalingrad began on August 23, 1942, when German forces, led by General Friedrich Paulus, launched a massive assault on the city. The initial German advances were swift, and they managed to capture large parts of the city. However, the Soviet defenders, under the leadership of General Georgi Zhukov and the political commissar Nikita Khrushchev, put up a fierce resistance. They engaged in close-quarter combat, often in ruined buildings and factories. The Soviets utilized a strategy of attrition, wearing down the German forces through a war of attrition. By November 1942, the situation for the German 6th Army, which was trapped in the city, became desperate. The Soviets launched a massive counteroffensive, encircling the German forces. Starved, battered, and running low on supplies, the German soldiers were in a dire situation. On February 2, 1943, General Paulus surrendered, marking the first time in the war that a full German army had capitulated. The Battle of Stalingrad had turned the tide of the Eastern Front. The Battle of Stalingrad was one of the deadliest battles in history. Both sides suffered immense casualties, 
with estimates of over two million killed, wounded, or captured. The city itself was left in ruins, a stark testament to the brutality of the conflict. The victory at Stalingrad was a monumental turning point for the Soviet Union and the Allies. It was the beginning of a relentless Soviet advance westward, ultimately leading to the capture of Berlin in 1945. Stalingrad serves as a symbol of courage and endurance, where ordinary people were thrust into extraordinary circumstances and refused to yield. It is a reminder of the sacrifices made during the darkest days of World War II and the indomitable human spirit that prevails even in the face of overwhelming adversity. In the vast deserts of North Africa, two brilliant military commanders faced off in a series of epic battles that would determine the fate of the region during World War II. This story explores the clash between Field Marshal Owen Rommel, the Desert Fox, and General Bernard Montgomery, culminating in the pivotal Battle of El Alamein. North Africa became a crucial theater in World War II, primarily due to its strategic significance and access to critical supply lines. Control of North Africa offered a gateway to the oil-rich Middle East and the Suez Canal, a vital shipping route. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, a charismatic and daring German commander, earned the nickname Desert Fox for his remarkable success in North Africa. Leading the Africa Corps, Rommel employed blitzkrieg tactics, characterized by rapid advances, encirclements, and hit-and-run attacks. His forces swept across North Africa, threatening Egypt and the Suez Canal. In August 1942, General Bernard Montgomery, a British commander known for his meticulous planning and discipline, was appointed to lead the British Eighth Army in North Africa. Montgomery inherited a demoralized and depleted force, but he was determined to halt Rommel's advance. The Battle of El Alamein, fought from July 1 to November 4, 1942, would become one of the most significant battles of World War II. Montgomery meticulously prepared for the engagement, building defensive fortifications and stockpiling supplies. His plan focused on attrition, wearing down the German and Italian forces through a series of deliberate offensives. The battle was characterized by fierce fighting, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. Montgomery's 8th Army launched a major offensive on October 23, 1942, breaking through the German lines. The battle marked the beginning of the end for Rommel's Africa campaign. Rommel, facing dwindling supplies and mounting pressure from the Allies, ordered a retreat in early November 1942. The Battle of El Alamein was a decisive victory for the British and Commonwealth forces, shifting the balance of power in North Africa. Following the Battle of El Alamein, the Allies continued their advance, pursuing Rommel's forces westward. The North African campaign ended in May 1943 with the surrender of the remaining Axis forces. The Battle of El Alamein not only halted Rommel's advance but also boosted Allied morale and marked the beginning of a successful Allied campaign in North Africa. For sake of discussion it's also worth noting, the Battle of El Alamein would become a defining moment in World War II. This story explores the epic confrontation between the British Eighth Army, under the command of General Bernard Montgomery, and the Axis forces led by Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, ultimately resulting in an Allied victory. The Battle of El Alamein, fought from July 1 to November 4, 1942, carried immense strategic significance. It was a critical juncture in the North African campaign, where the British Eighth Army faced off against the formidable Axis forces led by the renowned Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. General Bernard Montgomery, a methodical and disciplined commander, took command of the British Eighth Army in August 1942. Recognizing the need to reverse the tide of Rommel's advance, Montgomery initiated a rigorous training and preparation regimen for his troops. The Battle of El Alamein was characterized by a series of engagements, with the front lines constantly shifting. Montgomery's strategy focused on attrition, wearing down the Axis forces through a combination of carefully planned offensives, artillery barrages, and a comprehensive logistics system. On October 23, 1942, Montgomery launched a major offensive, Operation Lightfoot, with a massive artillery barrage and a meticulously coordinated assault. The battle-hardened soldiers of the 8th Army made significant progress, 
gradually breaking through the Axis defenses. Facing mounting pressure and dwindling supplies, Rommel ordered a retreat on November 4, 1942. The Battle of El Alamein had turned the tide of the North African campaign. Rommel's forces withdrew westward, pursued relentlessly by the Allies. The Battle of El Alamein marked a turning point in the North African campaign. Montgomery's victory bolstered Allied morale and momentum. It also opened the way for the Allied forces to push further westward across North Africa, eventually leading to the surrender of the remaining Axis forces in May 1943. The Holocaust, one of the darkest chapters in human history, witnessed the systematic persecution and genocide of millions of Jews during World War II. This story explores the horrors of the Holocaust and the mechanisms through which the Nazis carried out their campaign of hatred. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime, driven by virulent anti-Semitism, embarked on a path of persecution and extermination that would become known as the Holocaust. The origins of this tragedy can be traced back to the early 1930s when the Nazis rose to power in Germany. In 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were enacted, institutionalizing racial discrimination and anti-Semitic policies in Nazi Germany. These laws stripped German Jews of their citizenship and introduced a range of discriminatory measures, including restrictions on marriage and employment. On November 9 to 10, 1938, a violent pogrom known as Kristallnacht erupted across Germany. Nazi paramilitary forces and civilians attacked Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues, leaving a trail of destruction and death. Thousands of Jews were arrested and the event served as a harbinger of the horrors to come. In January 1942, high-ranking Nazi officials gathered at the Wannsee Conference in Berlin to formalize plans for the final solution. This euphemistic term referred to the systematic extermination of the Jewish people. The conference laid out plans for mass deportations to extermination camps and the construction of gas chambers. The Nazis established a network of concentration camps and extermination camps across Europe. Concentration camps were places of forced labor, starvation, and brutality, where inmates endured unimaginable suffering. Extermination camps, such as Auschwitz, Sobibor, and Treblinka, were designed solely for the mass murder of those who arrived. Auschwitz, the most notorious extermination camp, saw the murder of over one million people, primarily Jews, through a combination of gas chambers, shootings, and forced labor. The scale of suffering at Auschwitz and other camps defies comprehension. As Allied forces advanced through Europe in 1944 and 1945, they began to liberate concentration and extermination camps. The scenes that greeted the liberators were nightmarish, emaciated survivors, mass graves, and the evidence of unspeakable cruelty. In the aftermath of World War II, the international community sought justice for the perpetrators of the Holocaust and other war crimes. The Nuremberg Trials, held in 1945 to 1946, brought leading Nazi officials to trial for crimes against humanity. The trials established important principles of international law and accountability. The Holocaust stands as a haunting reminder of the depths of human cruelty and the consequences of unchecked hatred. The memory of the Holocaust serves as a solemn vow to prevent such atrocities from happening again and to stand against prejudice and discrimination in all its forms. By the end of World War II brought with it the liberation of Europe from Nazi tyranny and the pursuit of justice for those responsible for the horrors of the Holocaust. Here we will discuss the liberation of concentration camps and the historic Nuremberg trials. As Allied forces advanced through Europe in 1944 and 1945, they encountered a harrowing and unexpected sight, concentration and extermination camps where the Nazis had carried out their campaign of death and brutality. The liberation of these camps was a moment of profound significance. Liberating soldiers, many of whom were profoundly moved by what they witnessed, encountered emaciated survivors, mass graves, and evidence of unimaginable suffering. The survivors, many of whom were in a state of physical and psychological trauma, faced a long and difficult journey toward recovery. In the wake of World War II, the international community sought to hold the perpetrators of the Holocaust and other war crimes accountable for their actions. The Nuremberg Trials, held from November 20, 
1945, to October 1, 1946, were a landmark moment in the pursuit of justice. Leading Nazi officials, including Hermann Göring, Rudolf Hess, and Joachim von Ribbentrop, were among the 24 defendants at the Nuremberg trials. They faced charges of crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crimes against peace. The Nuremberg trials established important principles of international law, including the notion that individuals, regardless of their official positions, could be held accountable for their actions. The trials also underscored the gravity of war crimes and crimes against humanity. The verdicts at the Nuremberg trials were mixed. Several defendants were sentenced to death by hanging, while others received lengthy prison terms. Some were acquitted. The trials, however, sent a powerful message that the international community would not tolerate impunity for those who committed heinous acts. The legacy of the Nuremberg trials extends far beyond the courtroom. They set a precedent for subsequent war crime tribunals and the development of international law. The liberation of concentration camps and the pursuit of justice through the Nuremberg trials stand as testament to the resilience of the human spirit, the determination to hold wrongdoers accountable, and the commitment to ensure that the horrors of the Holocaust are never forgotten. World War II brought together a coalition of nations known as the Allied Powers, united by their common goal of defeating fascism and tyranny. This story explores the diverse nations that comprise the Allies and their collective determination to combat the Axis forces. As World War II erupted across the globe, nations with different histories, cultures, and ideologies found common cause in opposing the aggressive expansion of the Axis powers. The Allies formed as a counterbalance to the growing threat posed by Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan. The United States, led by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, played a pivotal role in the Allied coalition. Its industrial might, vast resources, and commitment to democracy made it a linchpin of the alliance. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the United Kingdom stood as a resolute bastion against Nazi aggression, enduring the blitz and maintaining an unwavering determination to resist. Despite a turbulent history, the Soviet Union, led by Joseph Stalin, became a crucial member of the Allies after the Nazi invasion in 1941. The Eastern Front would become one of the most significant theaters of the war. China, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, had been resisting Japanese aggression since the 1930s. Its tenacity and resilience were instrumental in tying down Japanese forces in Asia. While France initially fell to Nazi Germany in 1940, the Free French forces, led by Charles de Gaulle, continued to fight alongside the Allies and played a vital role in the liberation of France. The Allied powers encompassed a broad spectrum of nations, including Australia, Canada, New Zealand, India, Belgium, Greece, Norway, the Netherlands, Poland, and many others. Each made unique contributions to the Allied cause, whether through troops, resources, or intelligence. Despite their differences, the Allied powers were united by a shared commitment to democracy, freedom, and the defeat of fascism. They overcame logistical challenges, political complexities, and cultural distinctions to form a formidable coalition against the Axis powers. The Allies' victory in World War II laid the groundwork for the post-war world order. The United Nations, established in 1945, aimed to promote international cooperation and prevent future conflicts. The defeat of fascism marked a triumph of democratic values over totalitarianism. World War II saw the emergence of the Axis powers, a coalition of nations driven by aggression, expansionism, and a shared commitment to authoritarian ideologies. This story explores the key members of the Axis and their collective pursuit of dominance. The Axis powers coalesced around a common desire for territorial expansion and the dismantling of the existing international order. The Axis was marked by its aggressive pursuit of power and the subjugation of other nations. Under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany pursued an aggressive policy of expansion, violating international treaties and initiating conflicts. The invasion of Poland in 1939 marked the beginning of World War II. Italy, led by Benito Mussolini, joined Nazi Germany in 1939 to form the Romberlin Axis. Italy sought territorial gains in Europe and Africa, including Ethiopia and Albania. 
Japan, under Emperor Hirohito and the militaristic leadership, embarked on a campaign of imperial expansion in Asia. The invasion of China in the 1930s and the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 drew Japan into the war. While Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan were the principal Axis powers, other nations, such as Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Finland, joined or aligned with the Axis for various reasons, including territorial ambitions or ideological affinity. The Axis powers pursued their expansionist goals through aggression and conquest. Nazi Germany's blitzkrieg tactics rapidly overran much of Europe. Italy sought to establish an empire in Africa and expand its influence in the Mediterranean. Japan aimed to create a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere through military conquest. As the war progressed, the Axis powers faced mounting resistance from the Allied coalition. The combined efforts of the Allies on multiple fronts, including the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union, North Africa, and the Pacific, gradually eroded the Axis powers' strength. The aggressive expansionist policies of the Axis powers led to widespread devastation, suffering, and loss of life. The Holocaust, initiated by Nazi Germany, resulted in the systematic genocide of millions of Jews and other minority groups. The Axis powers' pursuit of dominance through aggression and conquest ultimately led to their defeat. World War II marked a turning point in history, highlighting the destructive consequences of aggressive expansionism and the importance of international cooperation in preserving peace and stability. June 6, 1944, known as D-Day, marked one of the most monumental events in World War II, the Allied invasion of Normandy. This story delves into the planning, execution, and significance of Operation Overlord, a daring and audacious endeavor that changed the course of the war. By 1944, the Allies had successfully liberated North Africa and Italy but faced a critical need for a second front in Western Europe to challenge Nazi Germany. The Soviet Union had been bearing the brunt of the Eastern Front, and opening a Western Front was essential to relieve pressure on the Soviets and hasten the end of the war. Operation Overlord, the code name for the Normandy invasion, was meticulously planned over several years. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, led the planning efforts. The invasion's success hinged on secrecy, timing, and the element of surprise. On the morning of June 6, 1944, the largest amphibious assault force in history assembled off the coast of Normandy. Over 156,000 troops from the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and other Allied nations embarked on a perilous journey across the English Channel. The Normandy coastline was divided into five sectors, each with a codename, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. These beaches were the focal points of the assault. The landing was met with fierce German resistance, particularly at Omaha Beach, where American forces faced a daunting challenge. Despite initial setbacks and heavy casualties, Allied troops persevered and gained a foothold on the beaches. They pushed inland, securing crucial objectives and paving the way for additional troops and supplies to land. D-Day marked a significant turning point in World War II. It demonstrated the Allied commitment to liberating Western Europe and served as a catalyst for the eventual defeat of Nazi Germany. Over the following months, Allied forces pushed through France and into Germany, relentlessly pursuing the enemy. The Normandy invasion remains an enduring symbol of courage, determination, and cooperation among the Allied nations. The sacrifices made on that fateful day, by soldiers and civilians alike, are commemorated annually on D-Day and remembered as a testament to the fight for freedom and the pursuit of a just and peaceful world. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in August 1945, marked a tragic turning point in human history. This story explores the events leading up to the bombings, the devastating aftermath, and the profound impact these events had on the course of World War II and the world. The development of atomic weapons was one of the most secretive and ambitious scientific endeavors of World War II. The Manhattan Project, led by the United States, involved brilliant scientists such as Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi. It aimed to harness the power of the atom. By mid-1945, Japan had not surrendered, and the war in the Pacific was still raging. 
The United States faced a difficult decision, whether to deploy atomic bombs as a means to hasten Japan's surrender. President Harry S. Truman, with input from military advisors, ultimately authorized their use. On August 6, 1945, a B-29 bomber named the Enola Gay dropped an atomic bomb, codenamed Little Boy, over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The explosion instantly killed tens of thousands of people and caused widespread destruction. Just three days later, on August 9, 1945, another B-29 bomber, named Boxcar, dropped a second atomic bomb, codenamed Fat Man, over the city of Nagasaki. The damage and casualties were similarly catastrophic. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had immediate and devastating effects. Tens of thousands were killed instantly, and many more suffered horrific injuries. The cities were left in ruins, and survivors faced the long-term effects of radiation exposure. The shock of the atomic bombings, coupled with the Soviet Union's entry into the war against Japan, led to Japan's surrender on August 15, 1945. World War II was finally over, and the world had entered the atomic age. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have left an indelible mark on history. The bombings also initiated the nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, leading to the Cold War. In the aftermath of the bombings, there were calls for nuclear disarmament and the promotion of peaceful coexistence among nations. The Hibakusha, survivors of the bombings, became advocates for peace and the abolition of nuclear weapons. Today, the memory of the atomic bombing serves as a somber reminder of the destructive potential of nuclear weapons. Efforts to prevent their use and work towards a world free of nuclear weapons continue to be of paramount importance, with the hope that the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki will never be repeated. The end of World War II marked the beginning of a new era, with profound implications for the world. In the wake of this global conflict, two key developments would shape the post-war landscape the formation of the United Nations and the onset of the Cold War. In the aftermath of World War II, there was a clear recognition of the need for a new international organization to prevent future conflicts and promote cooperation among nations. This led to the establishment of the United Nations, which officially came into existence on October 24, 1945, when its charter was ratified. The UN Charter, signed by 51 member states, outlined the organization's goals and principles. These included maintaining international peace and security, promoting human rights, fostering social and economic development, and providing a platform for dialogue among nations. One of the central features of the UN was the creation of the Security Council, composed of five permanent members, the United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, China, and France, and ten rotating members. The Security Council was tasked with maintaining peace and security and had the authority to take collective military action in response to threats to international peace. The UN General Assembly, comprised of all member states, served as a forum for nations to discuss and address global issues. Each member state had one vote, making it a democratic platform for diplomacy and decision-making. The UN played a pivotal role in advancing human rights and international law. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted by the General Assembly in 1948, set forth fundamental rights and freedoms to be protected globally. The Nuremberg Trials, held to prosecute Nazi war criminals, established principles of accountability under international law. While the formation of the United Nations held promise for international cooperation, the end of World War II also ushered in a new era of geopolitical tension known as the Cold War. One of the immediate post-war challenges was the division of Germany. The victorious Allied powers, the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and France, occupied different zones of Germany. The city of Berlin was similarly divided into East and West Berlin. The Cold War was characterized by an ideological conflict between the United States and its Western allies, which embraced democracy and capitalism and the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc allies, which espoused communism. These opposing ideologies created deep-seated mistrust and competition for global influence. 
Winston Churchill famously referred to the division of Europe as the Iron Curtain. This metaphorical divide separated Western Europe from Eastern Europe and the Soviet-controlled states, creating a geopolitical fault line. The Cold War saw an arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, each stockpiling nuclear weapons and conventional military forces. The fear of mutually assured destruction served as a deterrent to direct conflict but heightened global tensions. Rather than engaging in direct military confrontation, the superpowers often fought proxy wars in other parts of the world. The Korean War and the Vietnam War were examples of such conflicts where the United States and the Soviet Union supported opposing sides. The Cold War extended into space exploration with the space race. The launch of the Soviet satellite Sputnik in 1957 marked the beginning of this competition, which culminated in the United States landing the first humans on the moon in 1969. Over time, there were periods of detente and diplomatic efforts to ease tensions between the superpowers. Strategic arms limitation agreements aimed to reduce the risk of nuclear conflict. The aftermath of World War II was a complex and transformative period in history. The formation of the United Nations provided a platform for international cooperation and the promotion of peace and human rights. However, the onset of the Cold War introduced a new era of geopolitical rivalry and tension, shaping the global landscape for decades to come. The legacies of these developments continue to influence international relations and global politics in the present day. Marie Antoinette, born Maria Antonia Josepha Johanna on November 2, 1755, in Vienna, Austria, was destined for a life that would captivate and polarize the world. As the youngest daughter of Holy Roman Emperor Francis I and Maria Theresa, the Archduchess of Austria, her upbringing was steeped in the traditions and politics of European royalty. From an early age, it was clear that her life would be shaped by the intricate web of alliances, power plays, and expectations that defined the 18th century European aristocracy. At the heart of this web lay the marriage arranged between Marie Antoinette, and the future King Louis XVI of France. This union was not simply a marriage of love but a calculated diplomatic move meant to solidify the alliance between Austria and France. In 1770, at the tender age of 14, Marie Antoinette left her Austrian homeland and embarked on a journey to Versailles, the opulent palace of the French monarchy, to fulfill her role as Dauphine of France. Marie Antoinette's early years in Vienna were marked by the splendid court of the Habsburgs, where she received a rigorous education befitting her status. She learned the arts, music, and etiquette, preparing her for the demands of her future role as Queen of France. However, her life was far from the extravagant, carefree existence one might expect of a princess. Her marriage to Louis XVI was a strategic maneuver designed to strengthen the bond between Austria and France, traditional rivals in European politics. The young bride faced tremendous pressure as she stepped onto French soil, leaving behind her family, her native tongue, and everything familiar. In the glittering halls of Versailles, she had to adapt to a new culture, court etiquette, and navigate the complexities of French court politics. As a foreigner in the French court, she was met with curiosity and skepticism. Her initial impressions of France were mixed, with moments of splendor contrasting with the loneliness of being a young girl in a foreign land. She struggled to find her footing amidst the opulence and the strict protocol of Versailles. Marie Antoinette's early years in France were marked by an attempt to fit into her new role as Dauphine and future queen, even as she grappled with homesickness and the unfamiliar customs of her adopted country. These formative years would lay the foundation for the challenges and controversies that would define her reign as Queen of France. Antoinette's transition to Queen of France marked a significant turning point in her life. As she assumed the throne alongside Louis XVI, she was expected to embody the ideals of royalty and uphold the traditions of the French monarchy. However, her journey into queenship was fraught with challenges and controversies. The opulence of Versailles, with its grand parties, extravagant gowns, and lavish banquets, became a hallmark of Marie Antoinette's reign. She reveled in a world of luxury, often indulging in costly amusements. Her extravagant spending and passion for fashion earned her a reputation for frivolity, 
which would later contribute to her negative image among the French populace. Perhaps the most damning perception of Marie Antoinette was her perceived indifference to the suffering of the French people. As France faced economic hardship and inequality, her lavish lifestyle appeared out of touch with the struggles of the common people. This growing discontent would have profound consequences as the French Revolution loomed on the horizon. The French Revolution was a tumultuous period of social and political upheaval, and Marie Antoinette found herself at the center of the storm. The widespread discontent with the monarchy, fueled by economic crises, calls for social justice, and Enlightenment ideals, placed her in the crosshairs of public resentment. Despite the historical debate over whether Marie Antoinette truly uttered the infamous words, Let them eat cake! This phrase came to symbolize her perceived callousness and ignorance of the suffering of the French people. Regardless of its authenticity, it encapsulated the belief that she was out of touch with the plight of her subjects. As the revolution gained momentum, Marie Antoinette and her family attempted to escape from France, a move that would prove disastrous. Their capture and return to Paris not only dashed their hopes of fleeing the turmoil, but also intensified the public's anger towards them. The trial of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI marked a turning point in the revolution. They were accused of treason and found guilty by the National Convention. The monarchy was abolished, and the path towards the reign of terror was set, ultimately leading to the execution of the king and queen. Expanding on these sections provides a deeper understanding of Marie Antoinette's life as queen and the pivotal role she played in the lead-up to the French Revolution. Her extravagant lifestyle and perceived indifference to the suffering of the French people contributed to the growing discontent that would ultimately shape the course of history. As the French Revolution unfurled its banner of radical change and discontent, Marie Antoinette found herself at the center of the tempest. The desperate bid to escape the escalating turmoil in France became a desperate gambit for the royal family. Dressed in disguises and following a treacherous path through the countryside, their flight was a harrowing odyssey fraught with obstacles and close calls. Yet, despite their efforts to seek refuge in Austria, the royal family's capture in the small town of Varennes sent shockwaves across the nation, cementing their status as enemies of the revolution. The trial that followed was a highly charged and public spectacle, reflecting the revolutionary fervor sweeping through France. Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI faced accusations of treason, conspiring against the French people, and undermining the revolution. It was a trial that symbolized the end of an era. On January 21, 1793, Louis XVI met his grim fate at the guillotine, becoming the first reigning European monarch to face such a destiny. His execution reverberated throughout Europe, signaling the depths of the revolution's radicalism. Marie Antoinette, now a widow, awaited her own trial. Hostility permeated the courtroom, and she was swiftly found guilty of the charges against her. On that fateful day, October 16, 1793, she too ascended the scaffold, becoming one of the most iconic victims of the reign of terror. The executions of Marie Antoinette, and Louis XVI marked a profound shift in the course of the French Revolution. They symbolized the rejection of the old monarchy, the rise of revolutionary fervor, and the dawn of a new era. Yet, as time marched forward, the perception of Marie Antoinette underwent a transformation. In the immediate aftermath of her death, she was vilified as the embodiment of royal excess, a queen who reveled in luxury while her people suffered. Revolutionary propaganda painted her as an out-of-touch aristocrat, and her name became synonymous with decadence. However, in the latter half of the 20th century and into the 21st century, a new narrative emerged. Historians and scholars began to offer more nuanced interpretations of her life. They highlighted the challenges she faced as a foreigner thrust into the complex web of French court politics. These revisionist perspectives sought to humanize Marie Antoinette portraying her as a victim of circumstance rather than a heartless queen. They emphasized the constraints on her power and the unfairness of her vilification. The famous, Let them eat cake, quote, attributed to Marie Antoinette, also faced scrutiny. Many questioned its authenticity, highlighting the lack of solid historical evidence. Her story has not been confined to the annals of history. It has also been explored in literature, film, and art. 
works such as Antonia Fraser's biography and Sofia Coppola's film, Marie Antoinette, have provided different lenses through which to view her character, adding new layers to her legacy. Marie Antoinette's legacy, then, is a complex and evolving narrative. She remains a figure whose life and death continue to captivate the public's imagination. Her story serves as a lens through which to explore the larger themes of monarchy, revolution, and the enduring allure of royalty in history. She is a historical enigma, a character whose legacy continues to be reshaped by the ebb and flow of time and interpretation, a testament to the enduring power of history to both captivate and confound. The Space Race, a riveting and epical contest, unfolded in the late 1950s, casting the United States and the Soviet Union into a fierce rivalry that would shape the course of history for nearly two decades. This competition transcended national borders, propelling humanity into an era of unprecedented scientific breakthroughs, technological advancements, and audacious feats in space exploration. The space race's ignition point was the launch of Sputnik 1 on October 4, 1957, by the Soviet Union. This metallic sphere, adorned with radio antennae, commenced its orbital journey around Earth, emitting a distinctive beep-beep radio signal that reverberated across the globe. Sputnik's ascent marked a pivotal moment, as it signified humanity's very first foray into the boundless expanse of outer space. The beep-beep became an audible symbol of Soviet space supremacy, sparking both awe and anxiety on the international stage. In response to the Soviet Union's remarkable achievement, the United States was swift to take up the gauntlet. On January 31, 1958, the U.S. launched its inaugural satellite, Explorer 1, into orbit. This momentous event heralded the commencement of an intense and determined contest between the superpowers each vying for supremacy in the realm of space exploration. The apogee of this early phase of the space race arrived on April 12, 1961, when Yuri Gagarin, a courageous Soviet cosmonaut, embarked on a historic voyage into the cosmos aboard the Vostok 1 spacecraft. Gagarin's journey was not just a testament to human ingenuity, but also a testament to human courage, as he became the first human to transcend Earth's atmosphere and witness the majesty of space. His orbital sojourn, although brief, lasting a mere 108 minutes, etched an indelible mark on the annals of space history, inspiring generations with its audacity and pioneering spirit. However, the United States was unwavering in its resolve to close the gap. On May 5, 1961, just weeks after Gagarin's historic flight, American astronaut Alan Shepard took to the skies in the Freedom 7 capsule, becoming the first American in space. While Shepard's journey was suborbital in nature, it signified a monumental leap toward the realization of America's grand ambitions in space exploration. This inaugural flight was a testament to the courage and tenacity of American astronauts, who would soon venture further into the cosmos in pursuit of the stars. The early years of the space race, marked by the historic milestones of Sputnik, Gagarin, and Shepard, set the stage for an era of unparalleled achievement and rivalry. The race to conquer the cosmos was just beginning, and the world watched with bated breath as these two superpowers embarked on a journey that would forever alter the course of human history. In the relentless pursuit of reaching the moon, NASA recognized that embarking on the Apollo missions without comprehensive training and testing would be a perilous endeavor. It was within this context that the Gemini program was conceived and executed, serving as a critical bridge between early space exploration efforts and the monumental Apollo lunar missions. Launched in 1965, the Gemini program derived its name from the constellation Gemini, the twins, symbolizing the pairing of astronauts and the spacecraft. These missions were designed to be a testing ground, a place to refine techniques and develop the skills that would be indispensable for successful lunar expeditions. One of the primary objectives of the Gemini missions was to perfect the art of extravehicular activity, commonly known as spacewalks. Conducted in the vacuum of space, these daring forays required astronauts to leave the safety of their spacecraft and navigate the challenges of weightlessness. These experiences were crucial for astronauts to adapt to the harsh conditions they would encounter during lunar missions. Additionally, 
the Gemini program focused on mastering the intricate choreography of orbital rendezvous and docking, a skill that would prove vital for the Apollo missions. In 1966, during the Gemini 8 mission, astronaut Neil Armstrong, who would later become the first human to set foot on the lunar surface, performed a daring and successful docking maneuver with an unmanned agent at target vehicle. This achievement marked a pivotal moment in space exploration, as it demonstrated the ability to connect two spacecraft in Earth's orbit, a capability essential for the lunar module's rendezvous with the command module on future Apollo missions. The Gemini program was also instrumental in testing and refining the spacecraft systems and technology that would be used in the Apollo program. It served as a proving ground for the reliability of the spacecraft's life support systems, guidance and navigation equipment, and communication systems, critical components of lunar missions. However, the Gemini program was not just about technical achievements. It was a testament to the unyielding spirit of exploration. The astronauts who ventured into space during these missions demonstrated not only remarkable courage, but also the dedication to expanding the boundaries of human knowledge. In essence, the Gemini program was the intermediary step that bridged the gap between mere aspirations and the impending reality of lunar exploration. It laid the foundation for the Apollo missions, imparting the invaluable lessons learned from its trials and triumphs. These lessons included mastering the art of spacewalking, developing proficiency in orbital rendezvous, and refining spacecraft technology, all of which would prove indispensable in the audacious quest to land humans on the moon. The Gemini program was, in essence, the crucible in which the astronauts' metal was tested and their skills honed. It was the stepping stone that allowed NASA and the United States to ascend further into the celestial realm and approach the ultimate goal of lunar exploration, proving that with determination, innovation, and audacity, humanity could indeed reach for the stars. July 20, 1969, was a date etched into the annals of history as the world held its collective breath. On this day, the culmination of years of relentless effort, innovation, and ambition reached its zenith as the Apollo 11 mission made its historic descent to the lunar surface. The lunar module, carrying astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, approached the moon's desolate terrain with the hope of fulfilling President Kennedy's audacious goal. As the lunar module, affectionately known as Eagle, touched down on the lunar surface, the tension and anticipation were palpable. Neil Armstrong's famous words, That's one small step for man one giant leap for mankind, reverberated through the void of space as he took his momentous step onto the moon's powdery surface. With those words, Armstrong became the first human to set foot on the lunar landscape, an event witnessed by millions of people around the world. The achievement was nothing short of extraordinary. It was the culmination of years of planning, engineering, and sheer determination. It symbolized humanity's unquenchable thirst for exploration and the indomitable spirit that drives us to push the boundaries of what is possible. The United States had achieved what was once thought to be an insurmountable goal, landing humans on the moon and safely returning them to Earth. The Apollo 11 mission, with its successful lunar landing and the safe return of its crew, stands as an enduring testament to human ingenuity, bravery, and collaboration. It marked a pivotal moment in history one that transcended national borders and united people in their awe of the universe. The iconic image of the American flag planted on the lunar surface served as a symbol of human achievement, a testament to the power of science and technology, and a beacon of hope for future exploration. Following the historic Apollo 11 mission, the space race continued to unfold with a series of successful Apollo missions. Each mission expanded our understanding of the moon, conducted valuable scientific experiments, and further demonstrated the United States' commitment to space exploration. Apollo 13, despite its near disaster with an oxygen tank explosion, demonstrated the resilience and problem-solving capabilities of NASA's astronauts and ground teams. The conclusion of the space race came in 1975 with an event that symbolized a new chapter in space exploration, the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. This historic joint mission brought together the United States and the Soviet Union, the two former adversaries in the space race, in an unprecedented act of cooperation. 
The docking of an American Apollo spacecraft with the Soviet Soyuz spacecraft in Earth's orbit represented the end of the Cold War-driven competition and the beginning of a new era of international cooperation in space. The space race was not merely a chapter in history. It was a testament to the indomitable human spirit and our innate curiosity about the cosmos. It began with the launch of Sputnik 1 and culminated in the historic Apollo 11 moon landing. This era of intense rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union spurred unparalleled technological advancements, from the development of cutting-edge spacecraft to the miniaturization of computer technology. Furthermore, the legacy of the space race extended far beyond competition. It demonstrated the boundless potential of human innovation and international collaboration in the pursuit of common goals. The spirit of unity and exploration that emerged from this period laid the groundwork for the modern space age. International cooperation became the norm, exemplified by projects like the International Space Station, where nations work together in the peaceful exploration of space. In just minutes, we've traversed a pivotal period in human history, one that saw humanity daring to reach for the stars, surmounting challenges, and expanding the boundaries of our knowledge and capabilities. The space race was not merely a race. It was a testament to human ingenuity and our innate drive to explore the cosmos. Its legacy continues to inspire generations as we look forward to future missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond, forging a path toward a future where the possibilities of space exploration are limitless and the boundaries of human achievement are boundless. In the heart of America during the 1930s, there was a period of despair and hardship that would come to be known as the Great Depression. It was a time when the nation faced unprecedented economic collapse, leaving millions of its citizens struggling to make ends meet. In the vast expanse of the Midwest, particularly in the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles, a catastrophic environmental disaster known as the Dust Bowl unfolded. The Dust Bowl was not merely a chapter in history, it was a relentless assault on the very heartland of America. Prolonged drought, combined with unsustainable farming practices, had conspired to transform once fertile lands into arid, dust-choked wastelands. These were lands that had once yielded bountiful harvests, sustaining families and communities for generations. But now, the land lay barren and parched, as if it had been forsaken by the heavens themselves. The relentless winds, carrying with them choking clouds of dust, swept through the plains, turning day into night and swallowing entire towns in a suffocating embrace. Amidst the unforgiving storms of dust and despair, there were countless families like the Jodes. Their plight would later be immortalized in John Steinbeck's iconic novel, The Grapes of Wrath. The Jodes, like so many others, were forced off their land. The dream of a peaceful, prosperous life on their homestead was shattered. They found themselves standing at the precipice of an uncertain future, with the weight of economic ruin pressing upon their shoulders. With their meager possessions and hopes for a better life packed into a battered truck, the Jodes embarked on a grueling journey to California. It was a desperate quest for survival, for the chance of reclaiming the promise of a brighter tomorrow. Their story would become emblematic of the struggles faced by countless Dust Bowl migrants, all seeking refuge from the unforgiving storms and economic devastation that had swept over their lives. As the Dust Bowl raged on, hope became an elusive specter on the horizon. The question on the minds of many was whether there was any hope left to be found amidst the choking dust and despair that seemed to have engulfed the very essence of the American dream. While the Dust Bowl ravaged the heartland, thousands of miles away, in the bustling metropolis of New York City, a different kind of struggle played out on the sidewalks and streets. People from all walks of life queued up for hours at soup kitchens and breadlines, their faces etched with the weariness of prolonged hardship. Among those standing in line was Michael Sullivan, a former banker who had once navigated the hallowed halls of finance with confidence. However, the stock market crash of 1929 had shattered his world, wiping out his savings and livelihood in a cruel twist of fate. Homeless and destitute, Michael found himself seeking sustenance among the lines of those who had also fallen on hard times. In the company of others who had experienced the bitter taste of economic collapse, Michael discovered a sense of camaraderie and shared struggle. 
They formed a makeshift community where stories of better days were shared, meals were exchanged, and sometimes a glimmer of hope flickered in their eyes. Michael's journey through the breadlines was a stark reminder that the Great Depression knew no boundaries and could strike anyone, regardless of their background or station in life. It was a time when individuals from all walks of life were brought together by the common thread of adversity, forging connections born out of shared hardship. The breadlines of New York City became a symbol of resilience and the enduring spirit of those who refused to surrender to the challenges of their time. As the nation grappled with economic collapse and environmental disaster, the stories of individuals like Michael Sullivan served as a testament to the strength of the human spirit in the face of unimaginable difficulties. As the grip of the Great Depression tightened, makeshift shantytowns, known mockingly as Hoovervilles in reference to President Herbert Hoover, began to sprout up in empty lots and public parks across the nation. These were the last refuge for those who had lost their homes, their jobs, and their hope. Among the residents of one such Hooverville was Sarah Johnson, a single mother who had faced more than her fair share of adversity. With every dollar stretched to its limit and the weight of the depression bearing down on her, Sarah found herself in the most challenging of circumstances. Yet, even in the midst of hardship and uncertainty, Sarah managed to create a sense of home and family for her children within the confines of the Hooverville. She fashioned a shelter from discarded materials, transforming it into a place where laughter, love, and shared dreams could still find a place to flourish. Sarah's story resonated deeply with those who crossed her path. It was a poignant reminder that the resilience of the human spirit could transcend the harshest of realities. In her makeshift home, she wove a tapestry of hope that defied the stark backdrop of destitution. It was a testament to the enduring importance of family bonds, even in the face of adversity. In the bustling urban landscape of Chicago, far removed from the rural vistas of the Dust Bowl, we encounter Henry Turner. Once a prosperous businessman who had navigated the corporate world with ease, Henry now found himself on a very different path. He stood on a street corner, offering apples to passers-by as a means to eke out a meager existence. The transformation from a life of comfort to one of street vending was emblematic of the incredible upheaval that had defined the Great Depression. Yet, Henry's story was one of unwavering determination and an unyielding spirit. Rather than succumb to despair, Henry had embraced the art of survival. He had discovered that the key to navigating this new world was adaptability. The street corner became his stage, and the apples his props. He engaged with his customers, sharing stories and smiles, finding connection amidst the chaos. In the midst of the Great Depression, a time when the weight of despair hung heavily over the nation, there emerged a powerful source of solace and inspiration music. It was a testament to the human spirit's unyielding desire to find beauty even in the harshest of landscapes. In this act, we delve into the transformative power of music, embodied by the remarkable jazz musician Ella Williams. Ella's story unfolded against the backdrop of a nation in crisis. Economic hardship had cast a long shadow, and spirits were at an all-time low. Yet, it was precisely in these moments of darkness that Ella's talents shone most brightly. Her soulful, jazzy melodies resonated through the streets like a beacon of hope, cutting through the oppressive atmosphere of despair. As she played her saxophone or sang her bluesy tunes, Ella's music had an almost magical ability to lift the hearts of those who listened. It was as though the very notes themselves carried a promise that better days lay ahead. Her melodies became the soundtrack of resilience, embodying the unwavering determination of a people who refused to be defeated by circumstance. Ella Williams was more than a musician. She was a symbol of the indomitable human spirit. In the face of adversity, she had harnessed the power of music to uplift the collective soul of a nation in crisis. Her performances were a reminder that even in the darkest hours, there was still room for hope, beauty, and the celebration of the human spirit. As the 1930s unfolded, the nation found itself in the throes of the Great Depression, a period of unprecedented hardship and economic despair. It was during this time that President Franklin D. Roosevelt unveiled a series of transformative initiatives collectively known as the New Deal. These programs held out a glimmer of hope, offering a lifeline to those who had been grappling with the relentless tide of adversity. 
the New Deal represented a bold departure from the status quo. It was a comprehensive package of reforms and relief measures designed to address the myriad challenges facing the nation. It aimed to create jobs, provide social safety nets, and kickstart infrastructure projects that would ultimately revitalize a nation in distress. Among the many individuals touched by the New Deal was Maria Ramirez, a dedicated schoolteacher with a profound belief in the power of education to shape a brighter future. Maria's story was emblematic of the countless educators across the country who saw themselves as beacons of hope during these dark times. Through the Works Progress Administration, Maria found an opportunity to continue her life's work, teaching. The WPA's commitment to employment and public works projects extended to education, ensuring that schools remained open and educators like Maria could continue to inspire and educate the next generation. Maria's dedication to her students was unwavering. She recognized that education was not merely a means to impart knowledge, but also a pathway to empowerment. It was a tool that could help young minds transcend their circumstances, providing them with the skills and knowledge needed to overcome adversity and contribute to a better future. In a time when the nation was gripped by economic turmoil, Maria's commitment to teaching was a testament to the enduring belief that education was the cornerstone of progress. Through her work, she planted seeds of hope in the hearts and minds of her students, nurturing the idea that even in the face of the harshest challenges, there was still a path forward. The New Deal, with its focus on relief, recovery, and reform, would come to symbolize the resilience of a nation determined to rise from the depths of despair. Maria Ramirez, along with countless others, became a living embodiment of the transformative impact that these programs could have on individuals and communities alike. Through education, they not only weathered the storm of the Great Depression, but also sowed the seeds of a brighter tomorrow. Once the 1930s drew to a close, there was a palpable sense of change in the air. The Great Depression, a period marked by relentless economic hardship and societal upheaval, began to recede like a storm slowly passing on the horizon. However, it left in its wake a tapestry of stories, stories of hardship, resilience, and, ultimately, recovery. Families, once torn asunder by the economic turmoil, began to find their way back to one another. It was a time of reunions, of embracing loved ones after long separations, and of rebuilding the bonds that adversity had strained. The nation's cities, which had weathered the harshest of times, now stood as testaments to the enduring spirit of their residents. The rebuilding process was not merely about reconstructing physical structures, it was about rebuilding lives and communities. It was a collective effort that required unity, determination, and an unwavering resolve to move forward. The scars of the Great Depression were deep, but they served as a reminder of the resilience that defined the American people. The Great Depression was undoubtedly a period of immense suffering, one that tested the limits of endurance for individuals and communities alike. Yet, it was also a time when the human spirit was on full display, its resilience, creativity, and unwavering hope shone brightly even in the darkest of times. Through the countless stories of hardship and triumph, the Great Depression left an indelible mark on the nation's history. It was a chapter that underscored the importance of unity and solidarity in the face of adversity. It served as a poignant reminder that, no matter how insurmountable the challenges may seem, the human spirit prevails when individuals, families, and communities band together. As we reflect on this tumultuous chapter in American history, we are reminded that even in the most challenging of times, the enduring qualities of determination and hope are the beacons that guide us toward a brighter tomorrow. The Great Depression, with all its trials and tribulations, ultimately bore witness to the strength of the American people, a strength that continues to define the nation to this very day.